Okay, so now I want to talk about our hepatitis viruses. Our hepatitis viruses are called this because they all have one thing in common. They infect the liver. After that, they are all very different. There are two that are going to be connected, hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Hepatitis A is going to be fecal-oral transmission. Hepatitis C is going to be water transmission. And the other hepatitises are going to be sexual or body fluids. Drug use is uh, hypodermic blood uh, drug needles are going to be one of the leading causes of transmission of our hepatitis B, C, and D viruses. Now, our hepatitis A is going to be a non-envelope single-stranded RNA virus. It's of the family Picornaviridae. All our hepatitis viruses are going to be parts of different families. This one has a very nice cubic symmetry, which is going to be stable at very low temperatures and at very low pHs. So for example, it can last outside of the body for a long period of time. It can pass through the stomach very easily. There is only one serotype, so this means when you have immunity, you are protected. This will not have multiple serotypes like our rotavirus, for example. So you, once you're infected with Hep A and you develop an immune response, you will be protected from the next round of Hep A infection. The human is a common host. Fecal oral is the most important transmission for humans. This is associated with poor hygiene crowding. And so in San Diego, years back, they had to bleach the streets. because of an outbreak in the homeless community. And so it's going to be common in low socioeconomic groups. 90% in developing countries show evidence seroconversion to this particular virus. Hepatitis A is very interesting. So hepatitis A, you're going to have be infected And you're going to have an incubation period and you're going to be transmitting. And then you're going to get symptoms and you stop transmitting. and you're going to get liver disease. And so this is a GI infection. And so again, your incubation, the problem with this guy is your incubation period can be very long, 50 days. The pa patients are gonna be infectious one to two weeks before they get any symptoms. So you're gonna be detecting the virus in the feces a couple weeks before you get symptoms. When you're asymptomatic, you stop shedding the virus. So when you get symptomatics, you stop transmitting. And then you're gonna to spread to the liver. And this is going to cause damage to the liver, necrosis of your parenchymal cells, proliferation of your macrophages, um, and you're going to get lymphocyte lymphocyte infiltration. T cells are gonna move in to try to clear this infection. Now again, immune response is protective. That is why there is a vaccine available. It's a killed vaccine. Um, this can lead to jaundice, and jaundice is where the urine will become dark and the stools can be clay colored. And again, this is gonna be before um, the clay color before onset of jaundice. Many are gonna be in asymptomatic and they're gonna transmit the virus to other people. And there are no antiviral drugs available for hepatitis A. Now, hepatitis B is very different than hepatitis A. It looks very different. You're going to be a hepatinoviridae. It's a very unique virus. You have one full circular strand of DNA, 
and one partial circular strand of DNA. And so the viral genome is very unique. It's partially double-stranded. It contains a DNA polymerase as well, and it has on its surface the herpes surface antigen. That's what this means. I mean, herpes. This is hep B. S is for surface. And AG is for antigen. And this is the target of the vaccine. So here we have our envelope with our herpes, herpes, I keep saying that, sorry, hepatitis B surface antigen. Okay, so hepatitis B is going to have chronic carriers as a reservoir. We have about 300,000 new cases every year, a lot of people infected with this virus, and about 5 to 10 percent become chronic carriers. Some will die, again, it's acute virus infection, and virus infections have that ability to kill the infected person. Some will go on to develop cirrhosis of the liver. Others will develop carcinoma of the liver. About 50% are sexually transmitted. The others in the United States come from hypodermic needles and tattooing, etc. But it's mostly those hypodermic needles that are going to transmit hepatitis B. Now, hepatitis B is going to have an acute phase if you clear the infection. So again, most will clear that acute infection. And your symptoms are going to vary. Incubation can be very long. It can lead to just you're getting tired. You don't feel like eating. You have pain in the upper right abdominal quadrant, which is very indicative. Other symptoms can be you have arthritis or a rash or jaundice. Now, again, most people will clear the infection, and others will go on to develop chronic hepatitis B. That can lead to cirrhosis, liver failure, and cancer. There is no antivirals available. There is a vaccine which is available. You can have passive immunity, serum globulin, that can be transferred to people who have infections. Of course, practicing safe sex and avoiding hypodermic needles that are contaminated is critical. Now our next guy is hep C. Hep C is another family of viruses, the Flaviviridae. This is an RNA virus. It has six different genotypes and multiple subtypes, so this is sounding similar to what we're hearing about our coronaviruses. Again, RNA viruses mutate a lot, especially our more simple RNA viruses. Transmission is going to be through blood transfusion, sexual transmission, needle sharing is going to account for 40% of all the infections now. Um, dialysis patients, heme dialysis patients are at risk, and there are many people that are infected with this in the United States. Now, hep C has an incubation period about 6 to 12 weeks, so again, very long. It's going to have about 85% become carriers. Again, not everybody, about 20, 15% to 20% can clear this infection, but most cannot clear this infection. And that will lead to a very long course of disease that eventually can lead to cirrhosis of the liver or a hepatocellular carcinoma of the liver. This is currently the leading cause of transplants of the liver in the United States. Now there is treatment. We now have a antiviral. This is a protease inhibitor. So this will prevent virus assembly. So it does not prevent infection. It's going to prevent the assembly of virus particles so you can get this virus under control. There is no vaccine available. The CDC is, going, is recommending now that people born between 1945 and 65 where blood transplants were given but were not tested for hepatitis C presence are at high risk and they should be screened. Now our next virus is hepatitis D or R delta. And hepatitis D is very unique as well. Um, it's a single-stranded RNA virus. This is called a satellite virus. It requires hepatitis C for its life cycle. It actually uses the hepatitis C surface antigen um, to make its own um, capsid, to make its own envelope, to, to 
so it can encase itself. So this means without hep B, you cannot get infected with hep D. Now this can develop into a super infection with hepatitis B that has a very high mortality rate. So that's why this is important. And again, our most commonly infected are gonna be our intravenous drug users. So a super infection with hepatitis B um, is going to lead to a higher mortality rate. Hepatitis D infection without hepatitis B would be abortive. The D would not be able to infect you. So again, prevention is through safe sex and no sharing of needles. And then finally, hepatitis C is a colicky virus. This is going to have a similar structure to hep A. It's a non-envelope virus, so it's a capsid. It can get through your stomach acid. It's gonna have fecal oral route. It's usually associated with drinking water. Um, and then you have subclinical acute infection in pregnant women is very important. The incubation period, again, with all of these hepatitis viruses is gonna be very slow. It takes time to migrate from the gut to the liver and then cause disease in the liver.